um, hello and so I'm also very much delighted to be here and um, to join this interesting event and to represent the Open Society Scholarship Program and definitely I would like to join um, all the welcoming words right now we've heard from our colleagues and from our program partners and just to thank you all for your great ideas and contribution to in the past few months to the book that we've just had a chance to all see and um, that was initiated by our long-standing partners um, by Natalia and by uh, Andre and also thank you for all the ideas and uh, suggestion towards um, preparing this conference because this uh, conference and this story of book is quite important for the open society scholarship programs because you do not only represent this unique global alumni network but also you do contribute to I fully agree with you to this wider debate about uh, the role of higher education towards civil society development so I hope that this particular event will not only help you to get to know more about each other, but also to think about future projects with National Foundation and with the entire network. With regards to um, the Open Society Scholarship Program, so I would like just to give a very brief information where we are right now and um, why we're no longer in, in Ukraine, but hope that you will find this of help and we'll be happy to to respond so, to any of your questions. Mm -hmm. So throughout our history, the scholarship um, program of the Open Society uh, Foundation have op offered um, really lifeline opportunities for academic freedom, uh, mobility in close society. Indeed, the scholarship programs for um, to individuals were always central to George Soros, our founder. So from the very start of his network or, and creation of philanthropic foundation that he actually set up in 1980s. And uh, the whole idea was to fight for more open, just, and democratic society. So as the first national foundation started to emerge in East and Central Europe, like Hungary, Russia, Poland, and later Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Czech Republic, Romania, and Bulgaria, new scholarships started to, um, and new initiatives were inspired often by dissident um, individuals with a vision and commitment to the role of higher education in social and political change. With the fall of Berlin uh, Wall and Perestroika in the area, the foundation engaged in larger reform projects such as transformation of social and humanities sciences. And they were mainly aimed at addressing the lack of critical thinking in the teaching or and uh, uh, studying of humanities and uh, social sciences in the Soviet, in the former Soviet Union. So the work of the scholarship program has been always driven by responding to need and uh, in a diverse and range of contexts. For example, the Burma Supplementary Grant Program in, uh, that was established in the beginning of 1990s supported over a thousand Burmese students at the time of quite acute political depression. While um, additional program that we used to offer supplementary grants in the former Yugoslavia supported hundreds of individuals from quite a war torn countries in the Balkans. As for uh, our last contribution, so in the early uh, years of the scholarship programs, and I'm talking about early 1980s, uh, up until, um, for example, the first five years uh, from 1982 till 1982, there were only 550 grants were awarded to scholars from the former Soviet Union. So now, 30 years later, we are proud to say that uh, close to 17,000 scholars from all over around the world, uh, the world have received support, and 700 of them are from Ukraine. So this is a really interesting opportunity. So and students and professionals, they were um, getting or in, um, furthering their knowledge in discipline at host universities across North America, uh, Europe, Middle East, Southeast of Asia. And mainly uh, alumni and former recipient, as uh, some of you, uh, you have started in quite diverse fields of studies, mainly uh, within humanities and social sciences, pursuing a quite a small number of undergraduate, but mainly master degree and doctoral level, as well as we used to support short-term uh, research and faculty development work. Oops. Sorry. 
So these days we do continue as the scholarship program to support uh, humanities and social sciences. So because they continue for George Soros and the entire network of foundation to be subtle and open-minded in the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of how we create the knowledge. So what we do right now, we offer direct support to individuals from particular targeted country. And this has changed in 2013 after the foundation had a dramatic uh, budget cut, and there was this serious re, um, uh, reconceptualization of our work, where um, where the stories decided that uh, from former Soviet Union, so we decided to move more towards Africa, Middle East, and uh, Southeast of Asia, with living only a couple of countries in former, we call it traditional region in uh, Eurasia. It's only these days we do support our scholarship in Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, Belarus, and um, yes, and yeah, so f five countries, yeah. Azerbaijan, Belarus, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, yeah. So, and the profile we seek to help are people with a clear potential to lead uh, civil society, but those who had really serious uh, deficiency and access to, uh, towards, um, you know, I mean, influencing their peers uh, elsewhere. So currently in 2013, mainly, we do support three main programs. And the first one is Civil Society Leadership Award. So this is just to help us and fully funded MA degrees across uh, uh, four main regions where, uh, where we do operate, as I mentioned, in Eurasia, five countries in Southeast of Asia, it's uh, Burma, Laos, and Cambodia, in the Middle East, Egypt, Syria, and um, uh, um, Libya, Syria, and Egypt, yeah. And uh, mainly we do operate right now in Africa. So the Civil Society Leadership Award, so we directly assist future leaders or current leaders in countries where, um, according to uh, our colleagues and uh, the situation in the country, civil society is really challenged by a deficit of democratic practices and local governance and social development. Another big program that we support is Civil Society Scholar Awards. So this program we do operate in uh, many other countries, so not only within those uh, that I've uh, already highlighted, but this is to support doctoral students at universities and faculties. Uh, and it's uh, to support international academic mobility to enable doctoral students and university to get access to resources outside of their uh, home country. And our newly introduced program is Civil Society Professional uh, Programs. This is actually a new program that I hope that your support uh, will be um, of help to us because this is a program to provide internship for our current students within the host universities, uh, those uh, organizations. Those organizations that would like to host our interns uh, to work with them with the full support from the Open Society Foundation. Actually, right now, uh, this is uh, we have a new call for those organizations that would like to take part in this uh, uh, in this program. So, and uh, the main idea is just to enhance the experience that our students received during the academic year. But um, there is this possibility of being involved in the internship either through the host employment organization or with all, or with informal mentorship. So we would like our students to also, after, upon completion of their study, to get some professional experience. And uh, in the first few years, we've been mainly cooperating with OSI affiliated organization, those organizations who receive support. Uh, this year, we will actually be recruiting new organization uh, uh, whose uh, mission and aim is close to the open society. And uh, they can be based anywhere in the world, but priority will be given uh, to organization in the grantee home country. As, uh, as you can see, organizations should be definitely non-profit and non-governmental, and they have to meet the values of the Open Society Foundation. So all proposed activities must be fully charitable and not include any activities that would uh, contribute with lobbying restriction. 
and uh, uh, it has to clearly indicate how the skills of our civil society leaders and uh, um, students will help to not only enhance practical and professional experience of the students, but it will also help the organization. So this is the opportunity not for the organi host organization to earn money, but more give a forum for those students, let's say someone will, I think last year we had a really interesting case, someone um, here in, the U in, in Ukraine managed to get uh, up to six months internship uh, where the organization will not need to pay any salary, nothing apart from sharing their expertise. So if you feel like that this is the opportunity that uh, you would like to take part, so they, those are the contact uh, email addresses of my colleagues where you can learn more about the program, about the requirement for host organization, or even if you want to be our mentor, so I highly advise you to contact my colleagues because they can provide really interesting opportunities, plus you do represent diverse range of uh, organization where I'm sure international expertise with no cost for your organization will be of help. So at this very moment, we have the call for host organization. So I um, uh, highly advise you to uh, take this into account. So I can also leave this then later with Andre in case oh, I'm here throughout the day. I'll be happy to advise more if uh, should you find this of interest. In terms of additional support through the Open Society and our particular engagement with our alumni, so as I mentioned, unfortunately, none of our three main programs that I uh, mentioned and presented earlier are available here in the UK, but the role of our alumni and here in Ukraine, we do talk of around 700 of you. We do uh, feel like that you can continue check through our website about really interesting areas of support that you can just get connected to entire network that what we're doing, we're always looking for experts uh, to support uh, different types of activities. You can always download reports, find experts, you can go get to know more what this national foundation is actually doing here, how you can just contribute towards national strategy in terms of developing more. Uh, support and uh, or supporting civil society. You can always get to know about additional grants that we offer, uh, not through the scholarship, but I'm talking about the foundation. And you know, Open Sight is a global human rights foundation that uh, offer quite a range of different um, uh, thematic and uh, other related programs. And of course, you can learn about any other events. So, but uh, from our perspective, and uh, in the next few years, we will be creating a new strategy, and it's going to be based on the regional component. And we hope that alumni uh, alumni component will be quite important. So we will continue just to, and maybe some of you a few years ago had the chance to attend our regional conference in Budapest. If not, this is something that we do plan to do on a regional base. So we're thinking to have a big regional conference, uh, alumni conference that will be mainly led by our um, alumni. And um, this is an opportunity particularly where we are no longer um, active in terms of offering scholarship, but to get to know what uh, you as uh, activist, academician, professional, policymaker, you, we would like to create this forum for all of you to meet and discuss any potential uh, projects and just to get you a bit more closer to the foundation. We've already in the past few years, we had really successful post-scholarship conferences in, um, uh, in Central Asia, in the Baltics, in Eurasia, in Middle East, and Southeast of Asia. Uh, it's a huge, it's up to 200 people, and we're not focusing only on one country, but we're trying to focus, and it's more thematic based. So this is a really huge, huge event that definitely you will be posted. But the most important thing, and particularly now, uh, whenever we do operate from the UK and US, there is this whole confidential and policy, you know, I mean, information for personal data. So we are no longer allowed, you know, I mean, to share any of your data. So we have to get your permission neither with the database. So we can't afford ourselves to have a live database that anyone can just search because we do uh, pay and respect, um, you know, I mean, just all the privacy. So therefore, the only way for you to get to know either through our advising centers, our partners, or just uh, regularly checking our website to get to know what are the events. 
We used to offer alumni grants. This was a small academic and community-based project for some of the initiatives within the country, but we have to discontinue for a while because uh, uh, it was not so easy to run the program with all different experts and, uh, you know, I mean, just required in, in order for us to assess and to uh, avoid this program. But we're thinking that maybe for small initiatives, we may think, but at this point, this is something to be considered and discussed. And of course, alumni communication. I mean, currently we do employ a number of um, uh, a number of uh, methods for remotely engaging with alumni. These include our annual publication. We do still have our scholar forum, the magazine that we offer uh, in order to highlight all the activities and initiatives within the country of our alumni. And uh, also, we do produce important issue-based work to be placed in open society voices. So sometimes, uh, again, once again, you can just check our website and to see some interesting um, articles or voices about the situation in the country in, in case if you want to raise awareness and just to uh, get into interesting debate about particular field. Uh, so just at the end of uh, my brief speech, I just want to wish you all, you know, I mean, a very interesting and uh, mm, kind of like thought-provoking event. And although there are not many of us here, it is still quite important thing, you know, I mean, just that uh, after a while uh, to meet with our, not only colleagues and uh, with alumni and just to see your interest in terms of getting closer and uh, staying connected to the work of uh, your previous scholarship, but also to be closer to the foundation. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm here till the end of today, so I'll be happy to um, continue our discussion if you find this of uh, interest. Thank you. Thank you. Do we still have time for questions? Mm -hmm. and this process initiated, I would like to start with these yep. questions. Uh, three yeah. There's nothing in this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, last year, as a part of a core grant for advising centers, was a, a call for alumni-related activities. And uh, can we expect the second call this year to initiate some kind of interaction between advising centers and alumni this year? What will be the priorities for such grants? And how can we, alumni and advising centers, submit this proposal? Thank you so much, Andre. As I mentioned, so at this point, I think last year that was for the first time, and that was also another idea, because at the end of the day, as a former recipient, you are not scholars and recipients of our foundation. You're first of all, yeah, I mean, just recipients of, uh, um, you know, I mean, program that, and, uh, you know, I mean, just, we just want to, for you to stay connected to advising centers and to see how you can cooperate. So therefore, last year, that was the idea, how we can get them more connected to the National Foundation rather than to us. So this year, we're still at the stage. We're thinking, because it was as a trial, you know what I mean? So we received interesting proposal, and yet the main issue is just how to um, bring in as many as possible alumni, you know what I mean, just to, and to think about the project. But at the moment, I think that as long as you have any community or other project that will also be, for example, even Ukraine, yesterday we had a very interesting discussion, like huge country, yeah? I mean, so there we used to have, and even now, right now, with the um, uh, Ina mentioned that there are a couple of branches across the country. So the most important idea is just to have this cross country, you know, I mean, project. It shouldn't just come only those from Kiev, only those from, you know, I mean, just uh, Lviv or Kharkiv. So just to have this, um, you know, I mean, cooperative and just a joint project that will meet the needs and value. But at this moment, it's too early to say whether we will continue because we're thinking about the regional alumni, you know, I mean, uh, strategy, how we can just um, come together and think what, what the opportunity will be there to stay connected. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, my name is Serhi Aharkov. I am a refugee pro from Donetsk uh, Medical Institute. Now I work uh, at uh, Dnepropetrovsk Medical Academy. And I'm teaching uh, the foreign students uh, from Africa and Asia, uh, but some of uh, them are from the European countries, uh, uh, internal disease. Uh, and I would ask you, uh, uh, could uh, they uh, could, uh, could be uh, participate, participate in your programs, uh, our uh, students from Africa and uh, uh, other countries, Middle East, for example. Thank you. Very interesting question. You, I believe you are talking about the civil society leadership and civil society. Yeah. You know, I mean, we do have the criteria, speci special criteria. I mean, just that uh, as long, for example, from Africa currently, we do offer only for those coming from Sudan, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Democratic Republic of Congo. Cong so, you know, I mean, particular countries. So they have to be representative of, uh, you know, I mean, those target countries. Plus, there is another requirement. And for most of you, you may remember even from your previous experience, you have to be resident of your country at the time of applying. So if, it's, if you've been away for around three months, you can be still considered as a resident. But if they've been away for quite a while, like a year or two or three, so they're no longer during the time of uh, competition um, and be eligible. However, I would still encourage them to review the eligibility at the time of the competition. So for the next uh, call, the Civil Society Leadership Award will, we will open next March. So I would highly advise uh, your students and or if you can just spread the word and ask them to check our website where they will find all the details. But this is like English speaking or French speaking and this is within uh, to get uh, master degree within uh, social and humanities science and within particular partner universities across Europe. So mainly we do operate uh, with a couple of legacy universities established by George Soros. It's Central European University, Graduate School of Social Research in Warsaw, Riga. We work with quite a good number of universities in the UK, a huge number of universities in Germany because they're all English speaking and we do cooperate closely with German uh, DAD offices. We also offer scholarship in France. And of course, there are a limited number of opportunities to study in the US and yet we have quite a good number of partner universities Universities. So yes, they are eligible as long as they do meet the requirement of the program because it's um, quite competitive. We, I mean, just as a as an example, I can say during the time when most of you uh, took part in our program, we used to offer up to 800 awards per year. After our significant budget cut, so now we are down to up to 200 only awards per year. So and this not only includes full master. A, a master degree level, but also doctoral fellowships. So now it's very, very competitive. And last year for civil society, we received 3,000 applications. 3,000 and only 170 will be awarded. So yes, but definitely, and we would actually be very much grateful because uh, if they manage already to be here and they have more experience, so maybe they're more prepared for all cultural and other academic challenges and adjustment. That uh, will be actually. This is another thing for Natalia and Andre to think how, uh, if you have more and more international students, how the role of alumni and your role, particular, to advise the students how to complete application because this is what we struggle so far. How ma in many cases the <coughs> students are not necessary because it's more online platforms uh, where we do struggle with receiving quality written application. And so definitely your role here will be instrumental as always. Yeah, exactly. That's what we can do for you as advising centers uh, to continue our cooperation. But as far as I know, you have uh, excellent examples of be best practices of cooperation between alumni who are not applying for grant programs, mm -hmm. but they are still in the countries of the uh, your former target region. Uh, so, uh, can you give just a few examples, a couple of them, how you can cooperate with advising centers? With Mainly, alumni? yeah, very good question, Natalia. So, I think that what we are very much excited uh, at this very moment, with all the expertise, not only in this room, but in all um, those countries where we used to operate, is just to seek your expertise to help us to assess new applications. So, we actually do bring our alumni advising centers to help us to read the application forms. We do 
you bring our experts, and that's why the book that you help will once again show us, you know, and your expertise and skills to engage you in our in-person interviews. You know, and we do involve alumni to join us for our alumni uh, for our interview trips to help us to select. With advising centers, um, I think I mentioned yesterday very briefly. Um, for example, from Eurasia region, all those five countries where we do operate, as the organization, we are not allowed to travel to Azerbaijan, to Turkmenistan, to Uzbekistan. However, we need support in terms of recruiting. And therefore, this excellent question uh, from your side will be also as additional way for us to attract many interesting you know, I mean profiles. So the role of advising centers at this very moment, I mean, just to help us to target. So if you happen to have, and you know you have so many universities where the list of eligible, you know, I mean, you will see eligible candidates. So maybe if you, again, if it's within, within you know, I mean, just your area, you can just make the announcement, bring them, arrange, you know, for example, in Azerbaijan, our colleagues, you know, I mean, um, they do bring those people, you know, I mean, to their centers. They do talk about what does it mean the interview, you know, I mean, they provide the same advising center. They do bring more and more alumni to help them to talk about, because sometimes what we face right now at the moment, it's quite interesting moment, you know, I mean, after supporting for almost 30 years, you know, I mean, scholarship within the former Soviet Union, we are kind of at the back where the whole understanding of international opportunities is just, oh, this is the trophy. All I need just to go and be in the States. But once they're there, you know, I mean, just, lack of academic proficiency, language, cultural shock, and you know, I mean, all these things, they're very, very um, important. And we wish that we will have advising sentence in all those centers uh, that will help us to advise and to inform those students that it's not only about your passion to get your MA degree, and obviously, I mean, just how you can later on utilize it back home, but how you can just peer, how you can work, and how you can get on board all the advises, you know, I mean, and that's why I, I, I still think that those advising centers will be of help. And we haven't yet thought how we are going to do it here in Ukraine, but um, it was absolutely helpful yesterday to hear from you, Natalia, that in Kharkiv you have more and more students from Tajikistan and other part now from Africa, so maybe we can even get some statistics and to see if those people are here on the short term, so how we can use this opportunity while they're here to advance their language proficiency and to get more information through through our centers. Uh, do I understand you correctly that uh, we advising centers together with alumni uh, can apply f not for academic programs or projects, but we can initiate and uh, make a application for social development projects? Mm. Quite interesting, yeah, already, you know, I mean, and maybe you can even use, again, this will be only whenever we have clear cr criteria, you know, I mean, just, yeah, but I think it's already a very interesting idea, you know, I mean, the social, you know, I mean, just, and uh, uh, other platforms, you know, I mean, just, mm -hmm. and how with all your expertise and the uh, country with having more and more international students, how maybe you can even think to be this forum, yeah, and just to help advance mm -hmm. preparedness of those students, yeah. I can put my question more specifically, even. Uh, uh, we in the eastern part of Ukraine are facing a lot of refugees, not only individuals, but mm -hmm. also institutions coming from the occupied territory. Uh, so there are people in need, and they, uh, they are people who are interested to actively uh, in, be involved in the social processes. So if they have an idea for just for refugees, uh, can we gather? <laughs> and make some project concerning I think, this I think it's quite, category yeah. of uh, uh, interested people. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. Natalia, yeah. that will be also Great. another thing. You know, I mean, it's kind of you're establishing those criteria that will most likely make your project more successful. But again, should you just also combine activities and um, engage your alumni, that will even combine make you... Combine differentiate, Exactly, course, yeah. More, yeah. more interesting. And definitely I would highly, highly here advise using this opportunity to have representation from National Foundation. Just to think, yeah, how we can even engage it in more closer, you know, I mean, just because there are really, we've just had a very interesting discussion about thematic programs and the expertise and knowledge of all of you, and here, particularly with such a remote areas, will be definitely of help towards, yeah, developing the strategy, and not only from the perspective of scholarship, but maybe there are some funds available here, you know what I mean, but all you need just to think how you can make it more 
a cute, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like to clarify one thing for me. Uh, so when the Open Society Foundation uh, closed almost all its programs in Eastern Europe and in Ukraine, uh, I think the idea was that the situation in region is going well and uh, the region is able to help itself. Yes, <laughs> but now... Uh, we see different tendencies here, yeah, both in Eastern Europe and also in the Central Europe, uh, the return of authoritarian, authoritarian tendencies, the rise of populism. Do you consider in this new strategy which you are developing now the possibility of returning to the Eastern Europe, to, the, uh, to Ukraine? Thank you so much. And I should say this is the most frequent question that we receive from all those countries where we do not long, 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 uh, we do not operate anymore. Unfortunately, no, not at this moment. But you never know because, you know, and this is the global board. This is how sometimes we, for example, Tajikistan and Afghanistan, they were not a part of our new strategy last, you know, I mean, in the past few years. But what is happening right now in Afghanistan and Tajikistan so last year, Juxor is approved, and they've been added, you know, I mean, to our list, although they were not a part. But at this very moment, no, we are not thinking about fully funded, you know, I mean, scholarship, because uh, I think the main question from our board will be, so in Ukraine, 700 alumni, 20 years or so, 30 years of support. So why do you think, once again, you know, I mean, the scholarship should give, whether they can just do something else, you know, I mean, in terms of supporting or whether international master degrees will definitely help or enhance and they need additional, you know, I mean, 10 or 20 years in order for opportunities to um, be more accessible, you know, I mean, just to those. And I think you never know. So at this moment, we are more focusing on our alumni engagement rather than just to provide more opportunities. Plus, you have, as we can see, compared to all those new countries where there is almost limit of opportunities to international educational opportunities, whereas here in, in Ukraine, it is still possible. Yeah, I mean, just, and I've just had this interesting discussion with representative from the embassy about all this US, yeah, and other opportunities to study. But, it's changeable, you know, I mean, so we can't even say a strategy for five years that there won't be any changes, particularly what is happening right now, and as Natalia, you know, I'm in the eastern part with all the refugees and other parts, so maybe, but not necessarily at this very moment. I think we're more looking, you know, I mean, at you as um, our unique, you know, I mean, alumni of experts, and because you can already, you know, I mean, just be more in terms of helping us to select a new generation. Maybe you can come up with more scholarships and other opportunities for others, maybe even within the country or within the region. But I'm really, really sorry to say that at this moment we can't say any concrete, you know, I mean, support because the focus, um, the budget is very, very much limited. So therefore, we have to focus our priority in the countries that were approved by the board.